Thanks, John, and thank you all for being here today. Uh, so I'm really excited to share with you the work that we've done on the new scheduler for Zio. But before we go too much into the implementation, I wanna talk to you a little bit about giving you the background of what is a scheduler and why is it important? So all these great features we get from Zio are based on Zio's fiber-based concurrency model. And fibers, as John talked about, are much more lightweight than threads. You can think of them like threads in that each of them represents one logical sequence of execution. But whereas we can only maybe have a thousand threads in our application, we can have a hundred thousand fibers going on at the same time. And it's much less costly to shift between these different fibers as well as fibers are safely interruptible. So we can acquire resources, we can interrupt in effect and we can know that those resources will be safely released as well as fibers being supervised and giving us execution traces. So we get all these great things with fibers, but the fact that we're using fibers also creates a new challenge for us. And that challenge is that we now have all of these different fibers that we need to map on to a very limited number of actual threads. One of the first things that we learn when doing functional effects systems like Zio is that there's very little value to having more threads than the number of cores on your operating system. That, that that's essentially the physical limitation on how much work you can do. And so there's no use in kind of pretending that you can do more work than you can actually do by having more threads for that because you're still doing the same amount of actual work and now you're doing more work just switching context between those threads. So we've got say four, eight, however many cores on our computer and we've got one thread for each of them, but we just said we're gonna have these thousands, tens of thousands, potentially hundred thousand fibers. So somehow we've got to schedule when these fibers are actually gonna to get to run on one of these threads. And you can almost think about this as like a manufacturing problem of if you were like Apple and each of these is like a assembly line you have and they can either be making iPads or iPhones or Macs or something else. Um, you've got to kind of schedule those assembly lines to actually do that work. And there are a couple of different considerations that you have to optimize when doing that. Um, so one is, uh, throughput and trying to, there's efficiency benefits in continuing to do the same work. Just like if you had an assembly line, you say, I wanna make 200,000 something instead of 100,000, you're gonna be more efficient if you do all that in one run versus kind of switching back and forth between these threads. On the other hand, there's also a consideration of fairness that we wanna give each of these fibers a chance to run, especially if they, are gonna do work that is relevant for another one. So we don't wanna just continue running this fiber if it's end up gonna be interrupted by this fiber here. Um, and finally, there's a consideration of locality. So each of these threads has its own cache, has its own local context here, and there's efficiency benefits if we can continue running the same related work on the same thread versus jumping between threads to do that work. So in Zio 1.0 and most other functional effects systems, the way this was handled in the past was with a single work queue. And so the idea here is that all work goes into this queue and then each thread just takes values one at a time out of this queue, does that instruction, one of those lines in that blueprint that John talked about, and then they'll take all the other items that get produced by that if that says, okay, we'll now do this other bit of asynchronous work and they'll just stick that on to the end of the queue here. And they'll just continue taking items off of the work queue like that. And so this definitely has some good things associated with it. 
of it means that each of these threads is always going to be used. So as long as there's work in this queue, none of these threads is going to be sitting idle. We're not going to have a assembly line that's just sitting there while we've got stuff to make. Um, but it also has a couple of disadvantages. So one is that each of these threads here is contending trying to take values from the front of this queue. And this queue is, is a pretty efficient implementation. So that's not a ton of work, but this is also quite a low level operation that's used all the time in the runtime. So we wanna make sure that everything is as efficient as it can be. The, the second inefficiency here is that when, work, when new work gets submitted that's a continuation of existing work, there's no guarantee that work's gonna be performed by the same thread. So here, if this thread is doing something, there's some continuation from that, that's just gonna go back to the end of the queue and then has an equal likelihood of being taken by any of these other threads, which means if there is a local cache or there's other information that's associated with that, that's gotta be reloaded by these threads, which is another inefficiency. So as we think about a solution here, it's helpful to think about what the other extreme would be. So we could instead have a separate work queue for each thread. And in this case, each thread is gonna take work from its own work queue. If there are continuations from that, it'll submit it back to its own work queue. And then we'll have some mechanism for external work that's submitted by other threads, say at the top of our program is just gonna get distributed between these different queues. And so the advantages and disadvantages of this are, are kind of the complement of what we looked at above. So on the plus side, there's no contention now on taking values from each of these queues because it's a single thread that's doing it. We also maximize locality here because the continuation from any work this thread does is submitted back to its own queue. And so we're guaranteed that that thread is gonna do the same work. However, this solution also has a disadvantage, which is that we can get unbalanced distributions of work between these different workers. So we could imagine that if this thread here quickly processes tasks A and B, we could have a situation where this thread is just sitting here not doing anything, while this task D is sitting in the queue and no one is doing it. And if we've only got, say, four threads that are doing our work, eight threads, having one thread sitting around not doing anything is a big cost. So this is a solution that might make sense for some specialized systems, but it generally puts a lot of responsibility on the user to ensure the even distribution of work, which is not what we want to do here. But this starts to point us towards what is a more efficient solution, which is that we can take that framework above of having separate work queues and we can add an element of work stealing on top of it. So we can address that inefficiency we described above where this first thread is not doing any work and its work queue is empty by saying that at that point, this thread is gonna start looking for work on these other work queues. And if it finds a queue with an excess item like this, it's gonna take some of that work and move it into its own queue. And so we trade off a little bit on the benefits of the separate queues because now we can have a little bit of contention where this thread is sometimes now stealing from this queue. And we can have some loss of locality because now this task D is going to get executed on a different thread than the one that originated that work. But that task D wasn't going to get run at all by anyone right now anyway. So it's much better to have it run by someone, even if it's not going to be the optimal thread to run it, than to have it just sitting here while idle, while there's also this idle thread. And so that's what we've done in the scheduler for ZO 2.0. Uh, there's actually some really good work on this in uh, Rust in their uh, Tokyo uh, framework. Um, and there's a really nice uh, blog post about that that I would encourage everyone to uh, check out. Um, but we took a lot of those ideas and adapted them to Zio, adapted them to some of the unique assets that Zio has, like the ring buffer. And we're very excited to share with you the performance from that.
So this is comparing the performance of uh, Zio uh, with our uh, new scheduler to Cats Effect uh, 3.0, uh, four different benchmarks for scheduling. So this one chain fork, just fork something that forks something else that forks something else a ton of times. So measuring your efficiency of sequential forking. This one here forks a whole bunch of things at the same time. So more of a fan out pattern. Uh, this ping pong one here sends something back and forth between two. So more of a message passing pattern. And this final one yield many measures the efficiency of just yielding back to the runtime over and over and the cost of doing that. And so you can see that on each one, Zio is as fast or faster than Cats Effect 3.0. So Zio users are gonna continue to enjoy being on the fastest runtime system in Scala for the 2.0 line, just they as they have been for the 1.0 line. Uh, and with that, I'll hand it uh, back over. Uh, thank you very much.